All right, what is up, movers? Uh, in today's video, I'm actually going to be going over a United States Chess Federation classic rated game that I played today. Um, I have a goal to try to reach 2,000 pretty quickly in over the board chess as well. Uh, as of the moment, my rating is 1560 for over the board play, but I very much think that I'm a little low on there just because my most recent tournament performances have been quite poor and I've always arrived tired and such, but. It's my goal in 2024 to try and get to 2,000 or at least close to um, an over-the-board play. But I played one game today uh, at the Columbia Chess Club. Uh, they do one game every Thursday, so if you ever want to play a game against me and are close to Columbia, South Carolina, then go sign up on their Thursday chess thing. But anyway, I played against an opponent, uh, Neil. I played him before at another tournament. So this was our second time meeting. I believe I won last time as well, but it was like a much harder game. Um, well, I just spoiled what happened, I guess. But anyway, this is the game. So I had the white pieces. It's a 90-minute time control. Uh, I started with b4. My opponent played e5, and I offer the exchange variation, which he accepts. And then typically it's normal for someone to play knight f6 or even to play uh, just f6. Um, these are the most common moves in the position. Um, obviously, I would hope for like a blunder or something, which allows me to win a rook. But instead, my opponent plays one of the less common lines, and that's bishop back to f8. So I don't know if his thought process was just that he didn't want to be in this weird position that he's unfamiliar with. Uh, he'd probably rather have some kind of structure, you know, more similar to what he normally plays with. Even if there's, you know, two pawns missing on the board, you know, if he could get a structure that he's happy with. I think he'd prefer that. But this does lose a lot of tempo, because now I already have two pieces developed. He moves his knight. I'd rather keep this diagonal since I just opened it up, plus I still want to have my bishop in the late game. So I go back. We get d6 out of uh, my opponent. He's just looking to play his bishop somewhere. I'm assuming probably g4 at some point. I play e3. Um, I do want to stay kind of flexible, as I've explained in other videos, where I want to play both of these moves and wait to move my bishop until I'm pretty happy with its spot. I don't want to just move it to move it. So I played e3 here, but this could also lead with a pawn push. He plays knight to f6, and I played d4. So since he doesn't have a way to claim the center with his e-pawn, and his c-pawn is being blocked by the knight, then I'm pretty comfortable knowing that I'm the only one who's going to have the center of the board here. So I gladly take it. I'll also pretty much be in control of my own destiny when I want to push these and have my diagonal. Um, sometimes when you have this kind of setup, it can get annoying because you don't have a good way of getting rid of this pawn. But in this game, you'll see that it's a different case. So he goes for d5, but again, it's delayed. So he has pretty much made a few delayed moves here. I bring my knight over to d2. <clears throat> the idea, of course, being just to play c4 and get rid of this defender. Again, since this c-pawn doesn't exist to uh, play support, then this will be an easy task. Excuse me. Um, so I play c4. And one thing I know that he's considering, or things that I've seen before, like lines that are common is that I see these sorts of things and that's really not an issue for me I don't mind trading off a knight the thing is I just want to try keeping my bishops on the board because a lot of the setups where I end up winning it's when I have these bishops uh, aimed and open at the king uh, but instead he just goes to defend this and I take so again two moves to develop so this thing has taken three moves to get here this has taken two moves to get there this pawn spent a lot of time to get nowhere really so even though he's one tempo ahead as far as piece development, I'm much happier with the location of my piece development, and I'm the only one who has control of the center. So I played a3, and this is actually the only thing that the computer didn't like about my game. So if I quickly flip to the review here, you'll see that I had a 92.8% accuracy, and there's only one inaccuracy in this whole game. No mistakes, no misses, no blunders. So the only thing it didn't like was a3. But I wasn't very happy with the idea of either of these moves coming in because I just felt like things could get messy rather quickly. 
Um, it's just more things that I have to, you know, worry about pretty much. So I just wanted to kind of kick that possibility, even if it means I'm delaying my castling. Uh, I was just thinking, I spent probably like 10 moves on this move, I think, so probably my longest one of them all. But I was thinking, I do not want to move my bishop yet, because I don't know where it's happiest. And I can't castle yet, obviously. These pieces are where they're going to be. This is where it's going to be. And I still also don't know where I want my queen going or my rook going. So I thought, okay, well, this is a waiting move with a3, but I'm going to be more happy with the placement of my piece as a result. And that's exactly what happened. So he castled, and now all of a sudden it became kind of clear where I wanted my bishop to go. So instead of, you know, having to go to a passive square like e2, because if you went here, then this move is no longer possible, because we get takes, and if knight takes, I'm losing a pawn. And if queen takes, then... I just have this doubled system, which is not too pleasant. So this allows me to play bishop d3. Now this move no longer exists because I have enough control over the square. Um, it's also kind of leading my queen into finding a good move, you know, where it can't really be kicked too much. Then my rook can come over to even one more square as an option. So that was kind of the thought process there. And we get captures from him. So I think what he was worried about is this exchange where he ends up losing a piece. So he wanted to move this here instead of going backwards. So he took, I took with a knight. I was debating taking with queen and pawn, but I figured why sacrifice my king safety when I don't have to? I already have a decent enough position. Uh, I think if I turn on the eval bar, it's got me at 0.7 of an advantage, 0.8, which if anyone knows the b4 opening, you know that it starts off not only a, not an advantage, but it's actually a disadvantage from just playing move 1b4. I'll go here and you see it's already 0.3 for black, which is just not the case. If I were to play like e4 or d4 or something, it's going to be like 0.3 or 0.4, something in favor for white. So just the fact that I've developed a tiny advantage is very good. But anyway, we get this. Queen comes forward to d7. He's trying to connect the rooks. And I had some thoughts about tactics where I could just push this and try to kick the knight and then chase it. And I was thinking if he takes with this knight, sorry, let me do that again. If he takes with queen, then I just take this knight, then I take this pawn, and the queen's hanging, so I get it. If he takes with knight, I was thinking I chase it one more time. If he goes back, I take, he takes, and then one more time I win the queen. However, the way that this tactic failed that he could just go the other way with the knight. And then I just lost a pawn, and I lost the center that I worked hard for. So I did not end up playing that move, but instead I just castled. Because I'm much happier with my position than his, so I'm okay with just doing all my moves. Like a move or two later, he brings his rook in the middle. This is what I'm talking about. Like all the moves that he's been doing pretty much, nothing's threatening at all. So I didn't mind waiting like two, three moves to castle. If I noticed that there were some tactics that started to work, or maybe a pin that had a lasting impact on my king, then I would have, you know, castled faster instead of wasting time with, like, a3. But in this case, I was pretty happy with the decision. I'm still happy with a3, too, um, even though it's considered an inaccuracy in this game. So my opponent plays h6. Let me turn the eval bar off again. But you saw it jump right there. The reason why it jumps is because this is kind of a pointless move. So whereas this move was a waiting move so that I could figure out where I want my pieces to go, this doesn't actually stop anything because my knight is never coming here. I don't have a bishop that's trying to get there. I don't have a queen that's trying to get there. So he's not actually doing anything there. Plus, his next few moves should be fairly logical. Like if he wants to make a move to actually stop something, you know, either prevent this pin, or just get this other rook onto the board, or maybe even just sidestep your king, move the knight back, and try playing for f5 just to disrupt this pawn chain. Like, I think there are a lot better moves that he could do than h6. Did I turn that on again? I think I did. But anyway, I played d5. <clears throat> I was between both moves, but what I didn't like about e5 is that the knight could come over to d5, and then I kind of am not doing anything here except blocking my own bishop, 
And then I still have to find a way to kick this. And I would have to either sacrifice my light score bishop, which would suck, or trade off another minor piece eventually to do so. Because pawns are never going to do anything with that. So instead, I opted for d5. Just split the c for my bishop to have a file, like I said early on in the game. If you could get d4 and your opponent cannot claim d5, you know, he pushed d5, but he couldn't claim it. So because of that, uh, I'm able to now have the diagonals that I want. And he goes back to b8. So the other option that I thought he would do is something like knight a5. And at that point, I would have gone bishop here to attack it one more time. And then if he protects, then... I could take and give him double pawns, but I don't think that's the best use of my bishop. I probably would have just maybe gone for the queen or something, or maybe just have this in the back of my mind um, as a threat against him. But this is what I kind of was thinking along the lines of. I had more thoughts at the time, but it's later now. It's like 11 o'clock, so I don't remember all of my thoughts during the game. But anyway, he goes back to b8, and... He's kind of just getting suffocated, right? Like, his pieces are all on the 7th or 8th file, apart from this one knight. Um, he doesn't have any central control, so I'm pretty happy with this situation. So I go uh, queen to b3, and the idea is that I'm threatening queen takes b7, but I'm also not, because I'm threatening a few things here. Um, for one, I'm threatening... To do this eventually and get some rooks in the middle. I'm uh, threatening to get this knight into the game. Uh, just a couple different ideas that I had. But he just straight up blunders. So, reason why this is a blunder, I don't know why they're not classifying it as one, but it's because of knight e5. And now what happens is I'm going to have a double threat no matter what. So, he has to move the queen, and wherever he moves the queen, he can't prevent me taking and having both threats available, where I'm winning a rook or I'm gaining uh, queen takes f7 check, which will lead to a huge material advantage, if not checkmate. So that's why that was a mistake on his part. He goes queen c7. There was no good move here. The computer would already probably say that this is like plus 4 or something. Yeah, 4.4. So this is already done. But he goes here, I take, and now he has a few choices. He can choose to just defend this and allow this move to occur and, you know, sack some stuff if he wants to. Um, but what he chose to do instead is just take this. And I think he's kind of banking on the fact that since he has a double threat on this knight, that as long as he survives my onslaught, that... You know, he could win this knight at the end, and he might be down a pawn or two, and his king might be uncomfortable, but I'll be out of threats. So that was kind of his mindset, I imagine. But I took a check. Uh, if he went here, probably would have just went knight here. Then up here, and then, yeah, this is probably the route I would have taken. But since he went here, I instead just checked him. He went here, so now I have this check, which leads into this check. Going this way is mate, so he just goes this way. I check him one more time, just so that I have uh, him in the right position to make this move. And the idea here is that this square um, it would not be checkmate, but if I'm able to move him here one more time like I did previously, then it would be. So he doesn't have enough pieces to win this either, so if he takes with the knight, I'm taking with the bishop, and then his queen's under threat, and I just want a piece. Um, and then I'm still going to take this and try to mate. But, um, yeah, he must have missed this tactic, but the game was over already anyway. But he just goes knight to d7. I go knight h6 check. Again, this is mate, but now this is also mate, so he just has no good option. And just like that, I was able to checkmate him on move 27. Uh, last time I played him, like I said, it was a it was a grind. I think it was like a 60 or 70 move game. Uh, I think it was the same time control as this time. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that was pretty crazy to me. Um, I think that I improved a good bit since my last tournament. I've also been playing more confidently. And, uh, yeah, just overall happy with my performance and just ready to uh, keep winning every week.
and then hopefully I can get my rating up to 2,000 a little faster. Um, I went up 7 points from this one game, so if anyone's wondering what a 250 point discrepancy will net you in terms of points uh, in USCF ELO, it's 7, apparently, or 8, I guess, kind of like a, I don't know. There's probably more factors that go into it than just the difference in ELO, but that was how, many, how much I gained today. Um, I like the Columbia Chess Club, though. They have uh, not the most members. Um, I think I saw, what was it, like maybe 30 people there today or something, but a lot of them were just like goofing around or like parents and stuff like that. And I think there were maybe like 16 people that actually competed, and they just split it into under 1,200 and over 1,200. So, I mean, I have equal odds of playing someone who's 1,800, and I have equal odds of playing someone who's, you know, 1,200, or in this case, 1,300. So my first week, I had an easier pairing. Um, next week, uh, if I come back, I hope that I get to play someone that's like 1,800, because I'll get more of a juicy rating jump from it. But uh, yeah, uh, excited to have this new series, and I will catch you guys next time.